Okay. So you can start now. Thank you. All right. Uh, Matt, do you want to uh, kick us off then? Yep. Yep. Okay. So today, um, Obviously, as you can see, we'll be talking about the government debt and long run growth and the relationship between the two. Um, I am Matt Johnson, and then we also have, you guys wanna introduce yourself quick? Um, I'm Connor Berg. Connor yeah. Olofsson. Yep, uh, and then move to that next slide. There we go. So um, with this, like I said, we're going to be looking at the relationship between uh, debt and uh, the GDP um, <clears throat> and how this fits all in together, uh, with the exception being the U.S., um, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about that later. But um, with this, <clears throat> um, the article that we read kind of is based off of the results and data of 44 countries, along with 200 years of data and 3,700 annual observations. Um, and then, oh, sorry, one second here. So quick question, so how does uh, inflation rate fits into the story? We'll talk about that uh, later. Okay. Yeah, that'll be a later point. Okay. Um, and also just to note on that, like the data does also cover, um, a wide range of political systems, institutions, exchange rate, and monetary arrangements, and historic circumstances, just so you understand where we're coming from with these analysis. So, so just to, clear, to, to, to clarify, this is a paper by uh, Reinhard Vogelhoff, right? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. All right. Moving on to the problem statement. All right. So, our big question that we wanted to answer is what is the effect of government debt on long run growth? Um, and the main takeaway from the paper was that at around the 90% debt to GDP threshold, median growth rates tend to fall by roughly 1% and average growth rates fell significantly. Um, the reason median growth rates only fell by 1% is because of the United States. Um, the paper was written in 2010 and right at that time was, that was right about the time that the U.S. hit that 90% debt to GDP threshold. Um, and because of the way the U.S. manages their debt, they were able to push off the effects um, for a little bit longer than normal. But most countries right at around 90% debt to GDP, um, the GDP growth rate per year will fall significantly. Um, today, the U.S. debt to GDP is about 145%. Um, in the last couple of years, we have seen GDP growth rates slow in the United States. It's hard to say this year because a lot of the GDP um, reduction is due to government lockdowns. Um, but a lot of economists um, predict that once we recover from the, the virus, um, GDP growth rates will, will begin to slow down as debt is increased. Um, and then as well in 2010, the external debt levels for advanced countries averaged 200% of GDP. That's not true today, but when the article was written, that was um, the average. Wait, wait, wait a second. So, 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 can you go to, so the current US debt to GDP, uh, debt to GDP is 140%. 40 so that's yeah. not national debt, right? So this is a private plus. No, that's federal debt. Really? Because. Uh, because the U.S. there's like a debt limit, you know, so it's, uh, the the federal debt cannot exceed uh, 100 percent or 90 something percent. Otherwise, uh, there's like usually there's a government shutdown. So, so this is the government's total debt, which is all debt owed. So two thirds of uh, the U.S. debt is owed internally, so to corporations and people. That's okay. kind of why the U.S. is an outlier, um, and that, right. that's about 20 trillion, and then about. Seven to eight trillion is owed to foreign countries, most of that being China. Um, okay. But the US does sit at about $27 trillion in debt total federally. Okay. And the so, GDP um, last year was about 21 trillion, I want to say. This year it's a lot lower, but that's because of right. the COVID. Right. Right. So their debt, debt does exceed yearly GDP for right now. Mm. 
Yeah, so I guess maybe it's just depending on how you measure. Because normally, so we, when we talk about the the, the debt, so like U.S. debt is around a hundred percent of GDP. It, it, my impression is smaller than that. But maybe they have maybe you are reporting or so the website so you show us reporting slightly different statistic. But that's that's fine. That's okay. Yeah, thanks. But overall, is is big. And then, so just uh, uh, just speaking, um, just talking a, a point he was trying to make. So this year, after this year, or toward the end of this year, so the U.S. debt to GDP ratio, I would say pretty much every single country in the world is going to increase for two reasons. Yeah. Number one, number one, GDP is slowing down. Number two, so we have a large uh, government deficit. So where does the large de government deficit coming from? Because pretty much every single country was. Yeah, we're going to talk about large... that in the next slide. We're talking about that. Oh, okay, very good. Okay. Yeah, so so I was trying to, because, again, so I apologize, because the reason why I, I do some explanation is because um, I ask you guys to do a lot of things. So, but then, so the, the things you're reading, the things you're presenting, in some sense, is going to link to what are we supposed to learn from the textbook. So uh, I try to do, do some explanation. So the rest of the rest of the class, so I can understand uh, what you guys have done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Yeah. You want to go to the next slide, Connor? Yep. <clears throat> um, so the main cause of government debt for any country is excessive government spending. Um, many economists theorize that no matter how much money a government brings in, they're always going to spend more. Um, that's how it's been throughout history. Um, but in the United States specifically, uh, the biggest expense is Medicare and Medicaid, which is about $1.2 trillion per year. The second biggest expense is Social Security, which is $1 trillion per year. And then the third largest expense is uh, the military, which is right around $600 billion per year. Um, the other cause of government debt throughout the world was the Great Recession in 2008. Um, there was a lot of government bailouts, or not government, but a lot of um, corporate bailouts and institutional bailouts. Um, throughout the world. And then specifically in the United States, we had um, unrestricted open market operations, which is um, also known as quantitative easing. Um, I'll talk about this a little more later, um, but basically it's the, um, the Federal Reserve was um, buying back old US treasuries and then they would slash the interest rates, which inflates the value of the treasuries they bought back well, wait, not in fact, deeply, you know? So that just make their interest payment lower. The, the, the interest rate is for newly issued treasuries. So when you slash the interest rate, old treasuries increase in value because they're at a higher interest rate. So the price of those old treasuries is increase. higher now, yeah. Right. Okay. So they can basically you're saying so they can issue the debt at a more favorable price, but at the same time, so they pay a lower cost to serve the old debt. Yep. And then they're holding the debt, the existing debt, they're holding it on their own balance sheet. Right. Um, that area. Yeah. Okay. And then um, recently, the a big cause of of uh, the government debt is COVID nineteen. Um, a lot of governments had to spend money to to bail out. And, and provide stimulus. Um, and in the paper, um, it, was, it was cited that um, within three years of a crisis, central government debt typically rises by about 86%. Um, and we can see that clearly in the United States, which is so, since um, January, our debt has gone up about 30%. So that's right on track with um, the, the prediction mentioned in the article. Um, and then specifically in the United States, this was from the HEROES Act, which was about $4 trillion of the $7 trillion spent this year. Um, a lot of that included local government bailouts in California, Illinois, and New York. Um, and then uh, a good majority was corporate stimulus um, for companies. Um, and then public stimulus, which was the stimulus checks that everyone should have received as well. All right, so the next question that we, want, we were asked to answer was why is this important, um, which we'll head into three different areas. The first one being inequality. Um, so bringing in a little bit of out, or outside 
uh, research, we looked at an article titled The Impact of Inflation on the Income Inequality of Bangladesh, um, which was reported in 2019 or June of 2019. Uh, and this looked at uh, uh, higher inflation increases, uh, asset inequality, and the authors um, reported income inequality has become a major public issue all over the world. Each year, the gap between the rich and the poor is rising, and the circumstance has turned to be miserable in many countries. Um, so relating it back to the United States, although we don't see it here often, um, if we continue down the same route we are uh, going towards, we could possibly see it. Um, so in this study, the authors reported that 1% of inflation equaled 4.99% of inequality. Um, so tying this back to our class, uh, we looked at Gini coefficient, um, which was the measure, uh, which measures the extent to which the distribution of income among individuals or households within an economy deviates from a perfectly equal distribution. Um, so in the, in, for the Gini coefficient, anytime you're looking at um, a graph, zero would be uh, perfectly equal. Uh, perfectly equal and then 100 would be uh, perfect inequality. Um, so we see here Italy, US and Japan have a high debt to GDP uh, ratio um, while maintaining a low Gini coefficient. Um, that jet, debt to GDP uh, ratio measures all goods and services produced by the country. Um, this ratio is pretty much, it's used uh, to indicate if a country is gonna be able to pay back its debts um, Japan most recently had a very high debt to GDP and had a default on it, uh, on their uh, debt. Uh, and then you see Russia, they're the opposite. They have a low GDP and high Gini coefficient. So kind of tying this all together, this slide, um, we're seeing inequality in what people own, but we're, it's not being reported in income um, as Gini coefficient. Does so, so wait, so, so so excuse me. So I wasn't clear. So what's the connection? So you talk about three things: um, debt to GDP ratio, inflation, and inequality. So can you can you explain a little bit? So what's the uh, connection between these three? Yes. Yeah, so the inflation, what we're seeing, um, the increase in inequality due to inflation is um, asset inflation. So if you own an asset, the value of that asset is going up. Whereas somebody who doesn't own an asset they're not seeing any increase in their values. But right, so that no, I get, yes. Yeah, so there's yeah. not as much. So with these countries that have a high debt to GDP, there's not really income inequality because people are still making more money, but there's asset inequality because people who don't have any assets, um, they're not really seeing a, a large like capital so, gain. So, okay, so here, so basically, so basically you are you are talking about broader extent, broader extent in broadly talk about debt. This is not national debt or not only government debt. You're talking about also like a private debt. Um, yes, but we're really comparing the Gini coefficients between countries mm -hmm. and okay. the debt to GDP ratio because in the article it talks about how the high debt to GDP ratio increases inequality, but we just felt it was necessary to um, specify what kind of inequality because okay. there's a difference between income inequality and and. Um, like asset inequality and who owns the assets. Okay, thanks. So we just wanted to specify that. Um, so the next important thing that we want to look at or why this is important is looking at investment um, since investment's a part of the measure of GDP. Um, so as government debt begins to increase, this uh, leads to higher overall interest rates, generally speaking. Um, so when market interest rates begin to rise, it D uh, incentivizes investments, and this could be foreign or domestic, or from foreigners or domestic, um, because when interest rates begin to rise, uh, domestic, domestically we begin to save, but foreigners, uh, we don't look as um, as a well put together market. Uh, so this looks at uh, people stop investing in industries such as home uh, manufacturing, such as automotive, and then government bonds, which is a big one. Um, so again, since this is a measurement of GDP, this leads back to that high debt to GDP ratio. Um, 
Then the last one that we wanted to look at was GDP, as we've been talking about here. Um, so when there's uh, inefficient government spending, this takes away from private markets. Um, this also leads to something that chapter six in our book uh, talks about, which focuses on inequality and poverty. Um, there starts to become income transfers that redistribute wealth from GDP producing activities to impoverish people. And this can be done in two ways, which the book mentions. There's conditional cash transfers, transfers which provide cash payments to eligible households. And in return, families must uh, satisfy program goals. Um, so families start to work uh, and that's how they kind of repay what they were received. And then there's social safety nets, which recognize that household poverty often is transitory rather than chronic. Um, this is a policy recommended that helps individuals and households when income and consumption come up short. Um, and this, these programs are designed to reduce inequality. Um, and that's more, that more or less happens in the short term, but in the long term, this results in uh, less growth. So uh, what is the solution to all this? Uh, and this heads into something we were talking about in the last presentation with chapter 11 and fiscal policy. Um, we looked at taxation. So there's income tax. Um, and this is something that's brought up every election. Uh, who do we tax more? Should there be more tax on corporate, more tax on personal? Um, Originally, we talked about uh, this uh, slide being named doing business as usual. You know, tax is going to change constantly depending on who is in office. So we looked at taxing or income tax. Um, the next would be luxury tax. Uh, so heavy luxury tax is heavy, heavy indirect taxes on luxury consumptions as a means of, means of enhancing the progressivity of the tax system. So uh, Luxury tax would be essentially taxing the rich more because they're buying, they're the only ones that can buy these luxury items. Um, so, so excuse me, so do you, do you see any, excuse me, do you see any country actually have these type of tax from tax law? Yeah, the United States taxes luxury goods higher than mm -hmm. other goods. Uh, not in a broader sense, no, it's only in narrative, right? maybe like a property or well, like, like if you want to buy a yacht, they uh, have a really high tax on something like that. And uh, it's considered like property tax. Huh? Yeah. So luxury tax, we are talking more about like specific items that are, okay. luxury goods that are taxed at a much higher rate. But, but, I, but I doubt so the, uh, but I doubt so they can raise a lot of tax revenue from there. Right. Probably it's like a small fraction of the total tax the government can collect. So the, in the United States, so we really largely rely on income tax. And right. overall for advanced economy, so we rely on income tax, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, I mean, so we put luxury tax in there because it's kind of like icing on the cake. Although we rely a lot on income tax, at least we sure. can get a little bit more with the luxury tax. Um, so whether we're, taxing the, the richest in the United States, we can at least tax them still some more because from what they're purchasing being alive. Okay. So it's just adding more to tax income for the United States government. So what is prison value tax? I So yeah. So uh, we had defined it as taxing future revenues, which reduces the value of current assets. Okay. Um, any questions on that? So can you give an example of this prison value tax? Yeah, so the way it's primarily used is the idea like, just to give an example, if we're trying to figure out a way to pay for social security, which is a long-term payment that's gonna come out every year. Um, right. They, they have this um, tax system where they'll tax future revenues from, for example, a real estate property. Mm -hmm. And by proposing those taxes, it reduces the value of the real estate property today because the future revenues are going to be smaller because they're paying more taxes. So it reduces that. the present value of the um, current asset. Okay. All 
Right. Um, so we wanted to take a look at it outside of the United States, uh, looking at a country that's doing really well, uh, and that country being Norway. Um, our initial thoughts uh, with Norway, um, so I had lived in Norway, just a little bit of background, and these three items were uh, really expensive uh, in Norway. And so our initial thought was possibly the tax, but it turns out through our research, it came back to purchasing power parity. That doesn't mean that tax on sugar, alcohol, and tobacco isn't higher than it is here in the United States. It is um, a few cents here in, or uh, there more than here in the United States. And they do that because they want to, their people to have a better quality of life. So they do that uh, by not only having higher taxes, but also through the price that they set those items at. So uh, sugar. So you think Coca-Cola um, here in the United States or in Nebraska, I'll uh, bring it back to Nebraska, a uh, 12 pack of Coca-Cola here in Nebraska is um, on a good day, maybe $4 at the grocery market. Well, in Norway, that same 12 pack is almost 10 to $11. Um, so this is called like SIM tax. Right. Um, and that's the same thing with alcohol. Alcohol is just a little different because they have a monopoly on their alcohol or above a certain uh, alcohol content. Um, and you have to purchase uh wine and spirits primarily through a government run store. Um, it's called Vinmo Polet, which is uh, translated back to English, the wine monopoly. Um, so this store is owned by the Norwegian government and they, they uh, essentially set the prices. So uh, their, the prices are high and then also uh, their tax still again is higher than it is here in the United States. And then the same thing goes for uh, tobacco, really high prices, higher tax on tobacco. Um, but their overall goal of this is for a better quality of life. So they don't want their people necessarily smoking or drinking a lot or consuming a lot of sugary goods. Um, their goal is for a better quality of life, like I mentioned. But to bring it back to what we learned in class, uh, it goes back to purchasing power parity. So when I was there in Norway, my dollar did not get me as much in Norway. And so it definitely showed when I would go and uh, buy a Coke from the grocery market because what would be here $1.50 was costing me three, three fifty. dollars um, And so we looked at it from a tax standpoint and then also uh, brought it back to purchasing power parity. Um, our next solution Yep. So bringing it um, again, talking about quantitative easing, I know we put this in um, a cause of government debt and as a solution. Um, the reason for that is when quantitative easing was originally proposed in 2008, it was seen as the go-to solution to increase um, GDP growth um, without increasing the uh, overall debt. Um, but basically what they're doing is the Fed is just holding its own debt. Um, they still have to pay that debt off eventually, even if it's to themselves, they still have to pay it off with interest. Um, so long term, um, they're, they're still, th that debt is still there. It's not actually getting rid of the debt. Um, wait, wait, wait. So excuse me. So uh, there's other main reasons of the quantitative easing is because of the hitting the uh, zero lower bond, no? Because they're because the central bank is hitting the zero lower bound for interest rate. So the other thing they did is they cut interest rates to zero. Um, no, no. They, so let me explain to you. So um, normally, so it's difficult to imagine if we can push the interest rate below zero, right? Yeah. And so back in 2008, so I mean, normally if there's a recession. Um, and then so the central bank, what the central bank can do is to cut, to cut the interest rate. The way they yeah. cut interest rate essentially just pump the, um, pump the money as you just thought, so like regularly. So they just buy uh, treasury and then so essentially inject money to the, to the market, right? Yep. 
And but now, so once you, uh, so but there's a certain capacity you can do. So once you purchase too much treasury, and then as you just pointed out earlier, so the price of a treasury is go, go up, that just effectively interest rate go down. But yep. so you cannot push uh, uh, the, the interest rate goes to zero. Or in some sense, so the, in the conventional way, um, in the conventional view, so central bank run out of emulation, uh, emulation to fight the recession. Right, and then so they find out a new way, so which is quantitative easing. So they are going to, um, so like the central bank is going to buy long-term debt, and then they're also going to buy like corporate bond. Yep. So, yep. Right. So exactly. by doing that, so they are going to uh, achieve two things. One is so they are going to reduce long-term interest rate because normally, so they buy like a, um, a short-term treasury bond, so that's going to reduce the short-term uh, interest rate. But now they are going to buy long-term interest, uh, long-term treasury. So that's going to bring down the long-term um, uh, interest rate. And the plus, they are going to inject uh, uh, inject uh, liquidity to the market by purchasing yep, yep. corporate, exactly. right? So that's yeah. Yep. And in some cases, it does have the effect of uh, causing yields to go below zero. Um, right. We've seen that in other countries, especially in the European Union. Right. Um, and we really wanted to bring up the, the point of this was supposed to be a one-time event in 2013. <clears throat> um, but as we can see through to 2020, they have um, persisted in this quantitative easing and they keep doing it um, till the day. And now their um, balance sheet is sitting right at $7 trillion. Um, and when asked about what the long-term effects of this would be, the head of the Federal Open Market Committee said that they don't actually know what the long-term effects are um, and that they don't really understand what they're doing themselves. Um, and then in, earlier this year in um, June, the head of the Fed, Jerome Powell said, um, when he was asked about it, he said that they don't really care what the long-term effects are as long as they can stimulate short-term growth. Um, but a lot of economists are predicting that there's going to be some major asset bubbles because the Federal Reserve is now, like you said, Dr. Fang, they're starting to buy um, corporate bond ETFs, which is something they've never done before. Um, so they're really just injecting a lot of liquidity into the market. Um, so a lot of economists are predicting major asset bubbles and um, in the worst case, a, a very devalued dollar. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also showed this study of the, the link between UK prices and the money supply, um, because as they increase liquidity and inject money into the market um, throughout history, um, the, the supply of money and the price index are almost perfectly correlated um, in the last couple of years because of quantitative easing and the way the government's managing its debt. We've seen the price index slowly lag behind the supply of money. Um, but it's predicted that it will soon catch up and we'll see some a great deal of inflation in the near future. And then we also um, wanted to bring up the Great Reset just because it's being talked about right now as a potential solution. Um, we don't think it's really a valid solution, but it is something that's being talked about. Um, and the idea is to erase all government debt worldwide um, establish government mandated labor. So the government telling you what job you need to work. Um, and the biggest thing is replacing shareholder capitalism, which is in its modern state um, described by Milton Friedman, the idea of pursuing corporation, corporations pursuing profits as the ultimate goal and the standard of living will follow. Um, they wanna replace that with stakeholder Marxism, which is essentially the government owns the means of production so, so just, just curious, so this idea has been um, uh, supported by some uh, uh, um, um, mainstream famous uh, economists? Yeah, they're the ones who came up with it, yeah. Like who? So this looks to me is, um, uh, too radical, so this, this, yeah, this idea. It's, um, the, the main, I think the big guy behind it is he's, uh, he's pretty high up in Germany and they're political. Oh, okay. I don't know exa his exact position, um, but okay. he's one of the big proponents of it. And it's a lot of it is in the European Union. Oh, gotcha. The people that are talking so this, this about This sounds it. like a very, very, very left. So this is, yeah, this so is very, very radical. Um, yeah. I think it would work, but it's just something we thought we should bring up as a potential solution because it's gained a lot of popularity. Right. So, I mean, I can understand. Months. I can understand. So, 
maybe like a debt restructuring, like some like a debt of forgiveness. I understand that. So that has been that has been talked about for a while. Uh, so that part I understand. And I also understand, so there's a, a lot of discussion regarding to shift away from Milton, uh, Milton Friedman's idea of shareholder capitalism uh, to stakeholder, uh, um, I would say like stakeholder capitalism instead of Marxism. So I understand that part. Uh, and, but yeah, so, but to me, so the way they, they, they mention this great reset, but I thank you for, for brought this up, is uh, a little bit too radical. And so I, I, I didn't know, so this government mandated labor. Is this something similar to universal basic income? Well, this is just, that's one of the aspects that came with stakeholder capitalism. Uh, that's why I said it's Marxism basically, but yeah, that's I one see. of the ideas that came with it is that they're going to tell people um, what jobs to work because they think long-term that's gonna be more effective at stimulating growth by making oh, people um, work the jobs that are necessary. Gotcha. All right. But I agree, it's way too radical. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then just moving into a quick recap in case you missed any points uh, for our conclusion. Obviously, the problem is that debt continues to increase. Um, and as well as, as government debt increases, that GDP growth decreases. Um, once government debt is 90% of yearly GDP, it starts to have a negative effect on long-term growth rates. And for perspective on this, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but as we calculated it, the U.S. is at that 145% for government debt. Um, another issue that is looked at is um, de debt versus development. Um, in order to develop, you obviously have to spend money, but uh, you don't want to spend a ridiculous amount. And then COVID-19 is an issue for about everyone right now, uh, which is increasing that debt, but not really uh, increasing that GDP that is needed. Um, and then with those solutions, taxation is typically the first thing that a government looks to to fix financial issues. Um, and then that radical solution of the Great Reset um, as a potential. So with that, um, if you wanna move towards the references and any questions that anyone has uh, for us. Any question? So you can you just move to the conclusion uh, slides? I, let me just uh, say a few words. So. Um, I'm also say so in the middle, I'm kind of uh, lost track of what it, what it, you are trying to do now. So given these conclusions, I think so uh, I have a bigger picture. So let me just explain to the rest of the class. So basically, so they are talking about uh, how government debt in general, so this government debt, or maybe the broadly speaking, so how uh, how the how private and public debt can affect economic growth. So there are there's a where uh, there's a kind of landmark research uh, find out the um, government debt once it reaches certain level that's going to have negative impact on economic growth. And um, so this is one reason we care about the government debt. The other reason we care about the government debt is so uh, due to COVID uh, due to so it actually just started with um, a great recession in 2008. So we have uh, uh, increasing on um, uh, uh, government debt worldwide now so this COVID-19 makes things even worse right so and then people start to think about okay so what are we are going to do with this government debt but certainly right now mm, I think pretty much uh, most of the economies agree uh, this is not a good time to talk about uh, how we are going to dealing with government debt so this the priority is how we are going to survive with this pandemic and um, but so these these uh, um, um, these um, um, uh, um, this statement itself actually um, give us some hint regarding to uh, what's going to be long term solution to government debt. So I mean, so now so we are trying to um, use government debt to rescue the economy. So the hope is so we want to bring uh, bring the economy back on track. Uh, in the sense, um, we have um, um, we have some sustainable economic growth down the road. 
So that being said, so if down the road, so we have uh, sustainable and high economic growth, so that will, re, not, will naturally brings down the debt to GDP ratio. By the way, so uh, what matters really is the debt to GDP ratio instead of absolutely, um, the absolutely value of debt, right? So I guess, I think so you guys already explained that very well. So yeah, so to summarize, I guess so in the future, I mean, so to look forward to the future. So I guess so, I mean, it's pretty much everybody agrees. So the debt is a big issue, but that's a really solution is how we can, um, how we can um, generate sustainable long-run economic growth and how we can slow down the accumulation of debt. I guess that's, that's probably is, um, is a more reasonable um, answer to that question. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Any question from the from the class? And I did want to mention one last thing. Um, the biggest solution, obviously, would be to reduce government spending. But I think that was kind of a hard thing to bring up because anytime Absolutely. you talk about reducing government spending, a lot of people get upset because they like what the government provides to them. Um, but that's I mean, obviously I mean, one of the biggest solutions would be to figure out a way to reduce government spending. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so there are several things regarding to government spending. Like the the previous group, they already talked about government spending, right? As I just as I just explained uh, during their presentation. So once the economy uh, getting more and more complicated, so we rely on government spending. This is one thing. The other thing is right now. So we are in this COVID uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. So government spending seems like this is the only way to help the economy. This is number two, and then number three, uh, Donner, so you just mentioned uh, interestingly. So because this political uh, friction, so I and mean, it's pretty much everybody wants to uh, spend more. And seeing like in the United States, so uh, these baby boomers, so they have a lot of voting power. They really want to have a more generous uh, social security and uh, more generous Medicare. So that naturally increases the government, uh, government deficit. Right, okay, thank you so much. So should we move to, okay, so we move to the next, next one. Dr. Fang. Yes. Do you want to?